Hello and welcome to a very special edition of Wake and Jake, an annual tradition of sorts as the trade deadline approaches and America's new GMs, Foolish Bailey, myself, my consigliere analytics department, BBD, and we're going to get into some mock trades. What should we label this, Bailey? I could call it deal or no deal. I could, sure. You know, I think last year was called making trades, but basically I'm going to give you the deal. And you've got to say, you know, deal or no deal. We're not going to really, you know, push each other for, oh, you need to throw in this one extra right. prospect who's the 27th ranked guy, but he's got upside, you know. But just if the general framework of the deal makes sense or not, that's going to be what you have to decide. I tried to, my original funny idea in my head was to try to dress up as that meme of the, like, the the internet trade guy who's got his hands to get, I give you um, and then I, <laughs> last night I was like, I don't have an outfit for that. And then I saw my weekly dumb blazer and I was like, let me put that on. And I've, I've just headed the wrong direction the whole time, um, for our little cosplay event here. So I'm, I'm sorry for everyone on the YouTube, but I thank everyone on the YouTube, uh, cause over 20 K the subscriptions are coming in. The people like Bailey, what's that about? Well, I, you know, I YouTube's my site. I bet if you go into the <laughs> podcast feed for this show, it's the exact same every episode. But just I do well on the YouTube, you know, because that's my it's my zone. It's my wheelhouse. It sure is. Well, let's um, let's dive in because I'm uh, how many I guess how many do you have in the chamber? If you don't mind me asking, I think I've got six. OK, OK, well, let's um, I'm excited to where see where you want to start. Um, And I guess the other thing I want to. I don't think this spoils anything. One of the rumors about this deadline is that there's going to be contender, contender trades. Like, I, I have mm. an extra bullpen, but you haven't. Do you have any of those lined up, or is this a lot of, like, you, you, you're you buying, I'm selling? Slash this I'm is selling. this is a very traditional, you're okay. buying, I'm selling. It's probably easier. It's probably easier. Yeah. Um, well, let's see where we go. And if I do remember correctly from last year, there were some mock Phone call answerings? Do you think we need that or no? Yes, I think we do need okay. that. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm open for business. Okay, so first of all, I, I guess I'll tell you who you are right now. Yes, that's Because you, you have been appointed, Jake, to, just to start. You're going to work a lot of jobs today. You're going to wear many hats. Yes. But you, Jake, are the GM of the Milwaukee Brewers. That's great. I, I mean, that's... I wouldn't say it's not in the realm of possibility. We have some good friends in Milwaukee. Everyone remembers the John Boy sausage race. There's a, the, people would be shocked. There's only a couple steps between that and <laughs> true front office responsibilities. But we're a very smart organization, Bailey. So you better, you know, this better make sense on my end. Right, yeah. That's, that's going to need to make sense on your end. <laughs> um, so you're... GM of the Brewers, you've yes. replaced uh, Matt Arnold, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a shame because he seems like he's been doing a great job. He just took over. It's a completely new regime there in first place. Um, but, you know, maybe you're answering the phone for him. And, uh, you know, someone gives you a call. And okay. you have to figure out, you know, uh, who it is and, and who they want to trade to you. So here we go. Okay. Ring, 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 ring. <laughs> Hello, Jake, Jake Storielli for, for Matt Arnold. I've decided Matt Arnold has gotten, he's gotten one of those president jobs. They're all in. He's Pobo. But I basically yeah. do, I do the work now. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> hey, hey, buddy. It's me, Chris Getz from the White Sox. Oh, wow. Chris, uh, you know, I, us, us northern men have to stay together, right? I'm going to put the phone down. Us northern men have to stay together, and uh, you know I know it's been a tough one over there, but I'm I'm sure the White Sox will be back to their golden years that they've shockingly never had for a team in Chicago. Um, but what do you got, Chris Getz? Well, first of all, I gotta say I have no idea what you're talking about because <laughs> I was just talking with Jerry Reinsdorf, and we both agreed we're doing an awesome job. <laughs> yes, we're killing it. right Yes, now. that's right. That's right. Beauty's in the eye of the beer holder. What um. Hey, hey. Well, you know, we, we do have a guy who, you know, this isn't just a rental, um, Milwaukee Brewers. This is a guy who has another year left on his deal after this. And I just have a feeling that he's probably one of the more likely guys to be traded at this deadline. And we think he would be a good fit for, for uh, your Milwaukee Brewers. Do you have any idea who that could be? 
I would just assume at our roster. I would assume, um, you know, I would Luis Robert and his team options look fine in Milwaukee. There's a discussion there, but I I'm going to assume you're talking about Eric Fetty and his resurgent uh, with his one year seven and a half million dollar deal next year as well. That is exactly who we are talking about, and again because. You know, Jerry and I had a conversation that we're doing so well. I mean, look at what we did. We signed this guy for two years on the Chief. We're yeah. talking about a KBO MVP. And if there's anything you guys in Milwaukee like, you like a KBO guy because you like yeah. your Eric Thames. You like your Josh Lindblom. This is your next guy. You got to get Eric Fetty. I'm looking at your roster right now. I'm telling you, I'm the GM of the White Sox, and I do not envy your rotation situation whatsoever yeah. right now. You have... Freddie Peralta, which is great. But then after that, we're talking Aaron Savale, Tobias Myers, Colin Rea, and really, really no five because of injuries right now. You had Joe Ross, you know, you had, you had, uh, uh, you know, Robert Gasser was a guy you were thinking about integrating in there. But uh, you, you need another starter for sure uh, to solidify your position. Well, so of course, I'll be offering up Eric Fetty. Well, let me slow you down there, uh, Bailey, because, you know, uh, sure. Uh, we may have some strengths offensively, defensively in our bullpen. Um, but, you know, we, we've got guys coming back. D.L. Hall, who people thought would be an all-star this year because of our, our Brewers magic, he's on the way. So I don't, I don't want you thinking, you know, we need starting pitching even though we only have four starters right now. Uh, but, yeah, sure, Eric Fetty, yeah. So to get Eric Fetty for the next two months plus another year at $7.5 million, Yeah. We want kind of your post hype guys. You know what I mean? Mm. Like these are guys that you thought were going to be part of this, you know, winning Brewers core, and they've sort of fallen by the wayside. And probably, honestly, for you guys, just looking at it, they may be burning a hole on your forty man. That may be it. You know, you may just want to get these guys off your forty man, and there's some value in that. So, so here's what I'm going to suggest: uh, we want Joey Weimer, mm. who is, uh, you know. Had a lot of excitement coming through the minors, like good power speed guy, plays awesome defense uh, in center field p- uh, potentially. But it looks like he's kind of, and I'm look, I'm just reading the tea leaves. Right. It looks like he's kind of fallen out of favor and you guys in sort of that that circle of young outfielders, the Mitchell, the South Freelick, the Blake Perkins shuffle. So it just doesn't seem like you guys are all that interested in him, but we, we could definitely be interested in him. And then we're also going to take Aaron Ashby. Um, you know, who is hyped, had some injuries and, you know, has come back and is walking like 20 percent of the batters he faces in triple A. We like it. We like the upside here. We like the post hype factor for us. The question is whether you're willing to relinquish these guys who, by the way, currently are not a part of your plans to win. Um, but they would, you know, get that major league experience necessary with us for sure. Aaron Ashby. Um For those that aren't familiar, you probably are because you're listening to a mock trade episode with myself, Bailey, and David. Uh, Man, highly touted lefty for a little bit. Everyone thought he was going to be the next guy. uh, Seeing an Ashby on the mound, that hits a chord for some baseball people as well. Um, And yeah, you're right. I mean, the injuries, injuries sure have kicked in a little bit. And then... The performance uh, really, really hasn't been where you'd expect. Uh, the walks, my God, that's um, yeah. I had not looked at those numbers. Seventy-two point two innings, seventy-four strikeouts at AAA, sixty-five walks, uh, sixty, <laughs> eighty-six hits as well. So we're um, we are searching um, for young Aaron Ashby, um. Joey Weimer is interesting because you're right. There's been a lot of body movement there. And Ashby is now 20, 26 approaching. Or no, he just turned 26. So mm-hmm. uh, there's still, you're right, the, the post-hype trade. And didn't they, the White Sox this offseason, when they traded with the Braves, wasn't that like a post-hype crop? Like For sure. They yeah. had, what was that? They traded over five guys and it was Soroka and it was. Yeah, Schuster. Shuster, uh, shoemaker, wow, who had like all had draft pedigree, right? You know? Everyone was either like first round pick or uh, had become a real prospect at one time, and uh, so the post hype White Sox, which I'm, I like, um, 
Joey Weimer. So myself as the Brewers, what makes me nervous is we love what we do here. We believe in what we do here. We've run the division. Um, like this year is our full establishment, traded Corbin Burns, and now we're more powerful than we've ever been. Like this is our, our emperor of the NL Central storyline. That, like how far removed would we have been talking about a conversation like this with Bryce Terang? Whereas like, you know, if you had hit me up this offseason and said, you know, Bryce Terang, doesn't look, doesn't look like it at the MLB level. Sure, he'll run and play some defense. He's become one of the best second basemen in, second baseman in baseball. Um, my initial reaction is an absolutely. Um, like you mentioned with our outfield depth uh, between Garrett Mitchell, when you said post-hype, I thought you were going to start there because he was supposed to be like the leader of the freshman and he's been essentially missing... Um, but he's coming back and starting to get some playing time. The Blake Perkins offensive uh, outbreak uh, when it was kind of looking like he was just going to be a defense-only guy for them. And when I look at my outfield, I mean, I've got spots, I don't want to say locked up, but Chirillo with early steps this second half, he's going to be there. Um, Mm -hmm. We believe in Sal Freelich to some degree. Uh, that it's kind of figuring out that final spot. And I just, Joey Weimer, he's been getting on base at AAA, but from what we've seen at the major league level so far, it's it's a scary offensive outlook. And not to be super rude to Joey Weimer, which I'm about to be, the batting stance is kind of tough. Like when you you come up with a unique batting stance, um, and then it doesn't work, (laughs) it's kind of like, just do it normal, pal. Um, while he does have really good minor league numbers. I mean, Bailey, if I'm being honest, I, I think that is a more than fair offer that if I was the Milwaukee Brewers, I would say yes. And I think, I guess I think the other thing that would have to be laid out here as I've broken our role play voices, teams care so much about control that if Joey mm-hmm. Weimer and Ashby click it all, it's the years of control that they would feel like they've kind of done well in this trade. Um, I don't know, though. I, the other side of this argument, dude, that one year, seven and a half million next year for Fetty is, is so valuable to one of these. One of these central teams is going to get Fetty. I've convinced myself of that. Uh, yeah, I think so too. Because of that contract, that the value of him is just more, where I think some of the bigger market teams, whether Dodgers, Yankees, whoever it may be, their main priority is, I need a guy that can help me win the championship. I think the Brewers, Guardians, Cup Twins are also looking for that. But when they see that one year, seven and a half mil for a starter next year, that's where the value comes in. Um, if I'm the Brewers, I'm... I'm easily punching that deal, and I guess the only hesitation in my voice right now is, am I going to land on that with every buyer side? Because, like, let's buy, let's buy. Right. <laughs> well, we'll just have to see. It'll, the stakes will, will get a little bit bigger as we move along. They're not all going to be, you know, cut and dry, uh, you know, let's go get Eric Fetty, Eric Fetty situations, you know? Do you think, do you think that the White Sox, uh, let's say IRL in real life, the White Sox, mm-hmm. Eric Fetty is going to be one of the bigger pieces. Um, I think, I, I guess that's an opinion. And uh, I guess if people don't know, like Eric Fetty's having a very good year and the Savant numbers are kind of there. Like uh, yeah. there's a lot of red on that baseball reference page. We've now seen a few KBO resurgence stories that I think like, Eric Fetty was a real prospect at one point. It, it feels like he went to the KBO, the light bulb went off just a little bit more, and he's he's found some value. I don't know if he's going to be a two nine eight ERA guy next year as well. Um, do you think that kind of package would get it done for Fetty at this deadline? 
Yeah, I, I'm curious about it. It'd, be, it'd just be interesting, like how how they still value guys like Weimer and Ashby, because I, you know, like I love both those guys, so I can definitely still see the upside, but I don't know if the industry necessarily still does. Right. So it's just a, it's a difference of perspective. Yeah, that's the um the what what's making me nervous and excited for this deadline. Uh, the the Hunter Harvey trade. Yeah. I don't know, man. I I feel like we're a couple years removed from like trading for a reliever. Like here's here's prospect number seventeen. He's he's never hit a home run, but man, can he run? That right. Hunter Harvey, they got a prospect who, again, at twenty two years old, he's uh, he's he's. Doing okay at the minor league level. I have no idea what to tell you about Caden Wallace, but they also got like a first round compensatory pick, right? That right. So they got they got like a top, you know, forty five pick in the draft, you know, so which meant they could like mess around with the bonus pool even more. And there's value in that for sure. And you know, at and the time and the place when everyone's fun fact, like you know, Gunnar Henderson was actually at the start of the second round. Like I don't know, seeing that price tag for. Hunter Harvey, I almost, just as the White Sox, I guess as the fan perspective, being like, hey, we did something right with Fetty. We took a chance on him for two years. That's paying off even more because he's got extra value to trade. That we're getting back Joey Weimer that seemed to flame out and Ashby that, again, I don't really know what's going on, but it seems like he must be in pitcher hell right now. Yeah. God. Um, okay, so Brewers, Eric Fetty, done. 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 Great, one great for talk. One. Thank you for calling, Chris Getz. Oh, it was a great talk. And again, just to be clear, we're doing an awesome job. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. Um, and scene. Okay. Uh, where to next, Bailey? Jake, congratulations. The people on Twitter who have been just asking, just begging for this, have finally gotten what they wanted. Jake Storial, you are the GM of the New York Yankees. Yes, yes. The twi- the people have spoken, finally. Uh, Cashman, Cash, he's had this big budget for how many years? You know, it was actually Gene Stick Michael who did all this. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and who's calling? Ring, ring, ring. Hello, Jake Storielli, uh, president of the New York Yankees. Hey, this is uh, this is Peter Bendix from the Marlins. Peter! My good man, how are you? Good, I bet you're glad to have me out of the division, right? Oh, you don't, mm-hmm, you don't even know. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm I, glad I'm talking to you, because, you know, as much as I, I love Kim Ang, you know, she she pulled out on that. Uh, Glaber trade that we had lined up a couple years ago. So I'm I'm glad that we can. I really hope we can get some things done and re- unify the Marlins and the Yankees fans once and for all. Yes, this will be uh, you know the Derek Jeter trade. Um, how that's probably not a good way of putting it. <laughs> Anyways, looking at our roster, mm. uh, just what stands out to you? Like like there's obviously like multiple pieces who fit here, but right. there is one that I'm kind of leaning towards right now, and I just want to see where you're at. Ooh, mm. if if I am the Yankees shopping on the the are you guys the Miami Marlins now? Uh, yeah, we sure are. We it's only been that for like ten years. <laughs> my my age showing with that. No one thinks of them as the the Florida Marlins anymore. Keep in mind, we talked to the Expos already, and they don't want to make a deal. They're so. out. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, the number one option would be Tanner Scott uh, coming out of that bullpen. That is the correct answer, Mr. Yeah. Tanner Scott. Let's talk a little bit about Tanner Scott because sure. this is this is a wild man. Yeah. I I enjoy watching this man pitch, but this is a wild man because last year with the Marlins, his walk rate dropped from where it had historically been to 8%, and as a result, he was basically one of the best relievers Oof. in ball. This year, he's still been excellent in the sense that his ERA is extremely low. It starts with the number one. He's 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 one yeah. dotting now as a pitcher, which is a good thing to be doing. Uh, and uh, but the walk rate's fifteen percent, mm. so there are definitely uh, some fears as well. And this is just uh, purely rental. You're renting a reliever. He's probably gonna throw like. 
22 more regular season innings for you, right? And then you get the playoffs, right. which is going to be more important. So, it, so I guess the, the question is, what's the, at least in the regular season plus playoffs as well, like what's the value of 22 fairly high leverage innings? Like, I don't even think, I don't know what, what the Yankees fan barometer is like on Clay Holmes right now, but I don't get the sense that Tanner Scott becomes the closer necessarily here. I think he's more seventh, eighth inning. You, you, you may disagree. Uh, over there in Yankeeville, I don't know what what is the general attitude towards Clay Holmes right now. Do you want committee? Do you like what are we talking? I think in a perfect world, you would have someone that if you needed a save, whether that's on a Clay Holmes off day or if you were coming, kind of the not the committee that bullpens were dreaming of a couple years ago. But if you see an 8 ninth inning, and then that ninth inning, it's Duran, Devers, Yoshida, I would prefer to go to Tanner Scott in that situation. Uh, the other hot topic, and I, I get, get my analytics consigliere's view on it too, um, there is just a weird thing with Clay Holmes that when he gives up a save, it's the same thing every time. It's infield single, which the Yankees go... Darn tootin', uh, you can't predict baseball, and it's like, well, if that happens every time, maybe that's part of the prediction. Um, there's a walk, and then there's an actual hit. And it's, it's one of those things where it's like, damn, we got dinked and, dinked and dunked to death, and you're like, but this is, it's also the closer with the most blown saves, which I know that gets tricky because he's an opportunity to save games. Beebs, anything I'm missing there? Yeah, in an ideal world... Clay Holmes would would be the Yankees would be acquiring a reliever to close over Clay Holmes, and he'd be seventh eighth innings, and he'd probably have the same issues in how runs happen, where it's like, yeah, he didn't give up crazy contact, but you didn't build a great infield to accommodate his pitching style. But that's that's a bigger picture. Issue. And I, I guess closing the loop on it, not revealing too much on our our phone call. Um, mm -hmm. Like I guess the other thing is right now there's not. You want that other person that would be like, hey, they should, they could be the closer. And it's like, Luke Weaver's been great, but I'm, I don't, I'm not ready for that. Tommy Canely has a great career as a reliever, but never like that ninth inning nails guy that you need that, uh, right now, Clay Holmes is like the unencumbered, popular word this time of year, um, closer that someone to at least challenge him. I think that would be welcome, and that could be Tanner Scott. So, and I'll, I'll point this out too. Like, there, I've heard a lot of uh, discussions that basically Tanner Scott is like who you want in a closer, which is these guys who are like a little wild, but they strike out a lot of guys and they don't allow a lot of hits or home runs. They're kind of across one inning, a little more predictable, a little more consistent. Like it is that kind of like a Raldis Chapman kind of style of like going after a save. Um, because yeah, like even if you have someone who's a, clearly a good pitcher, like Clay Holmes, right? Like there is, you know, you're asking the defense to do more basically, and that's going to introduce another level of variance. And so, yeah, there are going to be blown saves. So just from what I'm hearing from you guys, it's not necessarily like, oh, Tanner Scott comes in and he's automatically the ninth inning guy, but you like to have another option for a different style of ninth inning guys, another guy who is capable of picking up, you know, a save in a big situation. I, I think, again, I'll, I'll use the, the Red Sox for the example as now, but, you know, if, if in the eighth inning it's Wong, Tyler O'Neill, Wong, and, uh, you know, Dom Smith, I'd say, hey, maybe in the eighth, should that be the Clay Holmes lane if it's lining up for Duran and Devers? So that's... I. I think having that on the table would make any any team stronger. Well, let me tell you what we want okay. over here in uh, Miami. There are twenty games of wild Tanner Scott. What could you yeah. want? We've got yeah, you've got twenty games plus 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 the Yoffs. I'm I'm anticipating that's true. He would come in. That's true. Key in 16, the Yoffs. Sixteen Yoffs games, which the Yankees would use him every game, a la Wandy Peralta. Right. Right. <laughs> Um, okay, here's who we want. I, so from the Marlins perspective, I think right here, like this is a rebuild. I don't think they necessarily need to prioritize like big league readiness. They don't need to get guys who are necessarily even like 40 man eligible or anything like that. Like they want to get some like lower level, but higher upside prospects, we, some more question marky type players. We saw that in the rise trade. No, like they, they grabbed a bunch yes. of hodgepodge young kids, uh, kind of just playing the lotto game.
yeah, that's that's the route they they'd probably want to go this trade deadline. Um, so I've I've got three guys I'm looking at here, mm. and I, I just would you know want to quickly hear your thoughts on them. I don't need to necessarily, uh, you know, uh, just derail this podcast with discussions about players ranked yes. between 10 and 20th in the New York Yankees farm system. But I've got just keep an eye on Jared Serna, uh, mm. who's a 22 year old in high A. He um. Uh, just kind of like seems like a, a contact hitter doesn't strike out too much, takes his walks, tries to get on base. Uh, uh, he's in high A right now. He has a 116 WRC plus, so he's mm. been above average hitter. There's been a little bit of excitement about him. Uh, a guy who has uh, what in the prospect world they call helium uh, to throw mm. out a, a good prospecty wow. baseball term uh, is a catcher. They have in the complex uh, right now. Uh, like the complex league. His name is Ed Glean Perez. Mm. He is 18 years yes. old. He is walking in 20% of his plate appearances. He's also hit a couple home runs. He has a 140 WRC plus in the complex league as an 18 year old, which is very impressive. Right. Uh, that is, that is a level that is in terms of skill and age somewhat between like the Dominican rookie ball, which is the lowest of the low in professional affiliated baseball. And then, you know, full season, a ball. So maybe he goes full season, a ball next year and he's a catcher. Uh, and then we're also keeping an eye on, uh, and this is probably the name maybe most familiar to Yankees fans, uh, Brock Selvage, uh, mm. 2021 third rounder, uh, starting pitching prospect, uh, currently in double A right now, ERA in fifth, kind of low fours. Um, seems like he's kind of like a ground ball pitcher. Um, yeah. And we really, quite frankly, you might seem like a lot to ask for 22, uh, Tanner Scott innings, which is, which is what we've determined right. that this is, but, uh, you know, you're not giving up your big guys and we're just trying to get, you know, like, uh, some upside necessarily here. We're not, you know, we're not trying to get, uh, you know, guys who the, I think the value has already kind of been decided one way or another. So you're, you're asking for all three. We want all three. Mm. Mm. Um, this is where the Yankee mindset feels like something like this should be a layup. Yet at the same time, when you're running an organization, if you thought like that, I'd, I'd like to think the Yankees would be in a worse place than if, if you were giving up. If every year the Yankees gave up three prospects for 22 reliever innings, at some point right. that, would, that would hurt. Um, yes. Brock Selvage, we like him. Futures game, Brock Selvage. Uh, oh, that's you, good. You left that out when you were talking about um, our young star. Uh, who's who's doing some things we we like at Double A this year? Almost a strikeout an inning. Um, if I'm the Yankees, and this is this is where I will basically say the same thing, but land on the other side. Jared Cerna, and I'll I'll be rude to my guy here. Um, listed five seven one sixty eight. I I love myself a short king, but. Jared Cerna, in Yankee world, I don't know what he could possibly do to get called up and given a real opportunity. Like, right. like that's just real Yankee stuff. Like, them giving Ben Rice an opportunity this year was a big deal, and he was, like, one-dotting and killing it in the minor leagues. Like, he had... It looked like he had just figured it all out, and they heliumed him uh, to the Yanks. That, yeah, like, if Jared Serna, the catcher, I forgot his name. I think it was Eddard. Maybe I've been watching Let's too much. Let's just say it. Sure. Been watching too much Game of Thrones. Yeah, like, if 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 his eight, if an 18-year-old catcher who's not, doesn't have the nickname The Martian at this point hurts you, like, you need to... We're the Yankees. The bullpen is a problem. I think the Yankees ERA, uh, what was the stat? I think since June 11th or something like that, it was the Rockies and then them uh, as the two worst ERAs in baseball. And a chunk of that, chunk of that's obviously the starters, but a chunk of that's the bullpen that, yes, I, <clears throat> and it's it's my fear from earlier in this exercise, but for that hodgepodge, I guess in real life, I would assume the Yankees would fight back on Brock Selvage, just saying, like, he's futures game. We really like this guy. He's got the arm talent. Um, 
The other two, I, I think the Yankees are... To, to become a prospect that gets the opportunity to become the Yankees' starting catcher or the Yankees' starting infielder, like, the people in the past couple years that have done this, Austin Wells was a first-round pick, and now he is getting that opportunity. Glaber Torres was a top-five prospect. Anthony Volpe was a top-five prospect. To actually get that real opportunity, that if you're the Yankees and some team wants to take a chance on these guys, knock yourself out. Yeah. If we were if we were really doing this, we'd probably spend 24 hours trying to get you to take two out of those three, whatever you want. But, but it, and that's exercise. That's where I'm glad I laid out the Hunter Harvey part of this because if, if that's the Hunter Harvey price, which is a year and a half, um, yeah. but I think Tanner Scott has a little better high end. I think the lefty situation still plays in baseball. Losing experience. Um, that, yeah, I mean, I if that trade came out, uh, all of my Yankees, my strong Yankees Twitter following would be saying... Uh, cash got out, Jake got in. Like, that's that's where we're at looking for back-end bullpen help. So we've got a deal is what you're saying. Oh, it's done. It's done. And I I think Tanner Scott, I guess of a little, little wide-picture baseball, is Tanner Scott going to be the best reliever traded? I guess who are the other people? Carlos Estevez? Carlos pro- Estevez is yeah. definitely one. Um, the... The Nationals could look to move on from Finnegan, who's right. been excellent lately. So I think I think there's like a certain tier of guys. I, I wouldn't necessarily say Estevez or Finnegan are better or worse than Tanner Scott right now, but there's there's kind of a tier of guys that are like, um, you know, closers on a bad team, maybe more in a committee yes. or eighth inning on a good team. Yes. Um, okay. Thank thank you. I the the fan base is going to rejoice over this. Yes, and in exactly uh, five and a half years when Ed Gleen Perez is the starting catcher, oh. uh, will feel pretty good uh, in Miami. And, and I was like, can you believe they traded him for Tanner Scott? And, and Tanner Scott had like a 4.12 ERA in those 22 innings. Isn't it, isn't it so crazy that GMs actually think like that? And I realize they have to, but yeah. also, I don't know, man. If you get burned... You know who definitely thinks that way, though, is Peter Bendix. Like, yeah. he's, he's in it, you know? And that's last name Bendix. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if if I was a GM and Tanner Scott, could, I don't. I guess that would carry with you, right? Like the whoever traded uh, Tatis for what was it James Shields? I, I bet yep. that comes up in in their conversation. So I don't know. I guess you're supposed to live in fear for that. But if you're the Yankees, you should be scared that you haven't been to a World Series in 15 years, right? Exclamation point. Um, okay, I'm whew. That Yankees off that Yankees front office is stressful. I'm I'm looking for a, a different gig now. Where should I be heading? Yeah, we're gonna put you in a in a situation that is not stressful at all. Uh just kidding. You are the GM of the Atlanta Braves. Ah, okay. People are waving their arms on the sinking ship just a little bit. They're getting a little antsy over there. Well, if there's anything we know how to navigate, it's a trade deadline partner that's uh, right <laughs> so we're uh I'm so, oh did did we move to dallas yeah i don't know i got it's a deep south texas uh yeah i i left the rangers front office to join uh it was a brief pit stop collected another ring and now i'm in atlanta yeah you showed up in a bolo and the yeah. cowboy hat and we said we don't do that in cop no, county we're good we're good yeah pal. get that columbia fishing shirt on that's right yes you got you got to start dressing like you're an Easter egg every Sunday. <laughs> Dude, I mean, I'm pretty I'm honestly pretty close to that. Um, <laughs> what are you? You know, we we have a couple team needs. We are the Braves. Like we're built pretty sure. well. But what a who's calling even? Ring ring ring. Hello. Hey, it's me, the Tampa Bay Rays. Oh. We love the Rays. We we share a mark. Congrats on that new stadium. Maybe it it feels like this one has some legs. Um, that you know you're gonna need some players to fill out that ballpark in 2029. <laughs> yes, we're well. You know we're we're looking at this here trade deadline, and you know it's we we really don't have a bad team. We have a lot of pieces that could be moved. Yeah. Uh, you know, to a team like the Braves, but we're we're actually looking at you know, and I I just. 
you know, I was just scrolling on my phone, sitting on the toilet, and I just couldn't help but notice Max Freed to the injured list for you yeah. guys. Like, oh my gosh, what a bummer. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's a contract year for Max, um, but, you know, he's he's had some injuries before, and he's come back young, healthy, handsome, strong man. Yeah, I, I guess just, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just really a caring friend, if anything. I don't even right. care about making a trade, but it's just, it just looking at our roster, you know, just serendipitously, is there, is there possibly anything we could do to help that situation? Uh, I mean, you, you know, you can never have, you can never have enough pitch. You can never have enough arms come October. So if, if that's what you're discussing, I will need to say just before we get into this, uh, Nacho Alvarez Jr., who we just called up, uh, he is mm-hmm. off the table. So please do not, please do not ask about him. Thank you. That was that was a great comedy bit that just unfolded for the people only on yeah. YouTube. This is a YouTube app, guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the acting. Um, so, if, if your podcast only, the acting has been top notch. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, so, I I want to preface this by saying I'm gonna actually make an argument for the Braves here, even though you are in fact playing the role of the Braves. Sure. As to as to why uh, a trade for Zach Eflin in particular makes okay. sense. Um, so the Rays. Well, let me let me tell you what the Rays do. They they just they trade guys who are making money. They trade guys, you know, when they get a year or two into the arb. And I think that's why we're seeing a lot of discussions about a Rosa Reina this trade deadline potentially or Isak yeah. Paredes because those guys are getting there in the arb. Zach Eflin, the contract they signed him to was backloaded. Uh, yeah. It was a three year deal for for forty million total, but. Uh, the way it lines up, he he makes eleven million this year, but eighteen million in twenty twenty five. So anyone trading for him is trading for, uh, basically the rest of this year plus a year of Eflin at eighteen, which is not cheap, you know. Yeah, like that. Like, well, here's how I'd put it: it's that's the difference between like an Eflin and like an Eric Fetty, right? Like the because right. of that money, it's more likely that uh, <laughs> like you mentioned, like a smaller budget central team goes for Fetty, like the Brewers. Or the Guardians, if they want to trade, you know, within the division. Whereas a team that's not too afraid to take on salary would make more sense to even, I think, go after Eflin if the Rays were just purely trying to, uh, you know, dump right because they, maybe they're thinking because because honestly, dude, like Eflin's going to make more money than a Rosarina or Paredes next year, anyways. You right? Know? Yeah. So, I, so to me, so to me, that should be almost the priority for them. But that that also probably lowers the the asking price for Tampa if they are that desperate to not pay Zach Eflin 18 million, even though he's been pretty solid for them. Like, I think we know who he is Uh, control pitcher. He's going to get through innings. The ERA is probably going to be high threes, uh, maybe low fours. And it's one year, 18 million after uh, this year. Yeah. I think it's a great point by you, Bailey. And I, I do think the, a little shocking looking at Zach Eflin's page, uh, since 2017, which, you know, he was 23 years old. He was a kid. It was 11 starts. He's never had a bad time on the mound. His highest ERA in a season is 436, and that's 2018. It's just the other side of it. His lowest ERA in a season is 35, which was last year. So I've, I've almost never seen this little variation season to season from what Zach Eflin's going to get you that you're right on one year 18 is a little tough because he doesn't have necessarily that high-end potential that even Frankie Montas this year, the contract he got from the Reds, um, you know, starts to get in that range, but the Reds were hoping he would have a, you know, Frankie Montas has kind of a, a bigger ceiling than Eflin that I, I think for one year teams aren't freaked out by it, but it's it's the beauty of the Fetty contract that, the central teams are going to be wrestling over that. Yeah, absolutely. I think there I think there is a clear difference between the two because Fetty is owed 10 million less even though honestly to me they're probably like pretty similar pitchers, you know, it's yeah. just in terms of the value they're going to give you. Um so so with that in mind, here's what I would suggest uh you know, if I'm the Rays, here's what I want back from the Braves to get this deal done with the agreement being essentially that we will not eat any money on this deal. Mm. Uh, you know, you're you're on the hook for the rest of it. Um, here's who we want. We want uh, the, the the smaller piece is Dylan Dodd, who uh, 
uh, last year looked like he was going to be part of the rotation plans for the Braves. He actually broke camp part of the rotation uh, opening day uh, as their fifth starter after a great spring training, didn't do well, and uh, has only pitched in AAA this year and hasn't done particularly well. So he's a guy whose prospect stock has gone down. But also, like, if you're the Rays and you're looking at it, you're like, you can work with it because you can work with anybody, right? Sure. Um, the real piece here is uh, Drew Hackenberg. This is a guy with uh, a little bit of the helium uh, that we talked about earlier. The 2023 second rounder uh, out of Virginia Tech, uh, who is striking out currently. He has made uh, four starts in double A after earning a promotion from high A. He's uh, 22 years old. Uh, yes, I have that right. 22 years old. Uh, he is striking out, let me get this number right, 36% of the batters he faces uh, at the double-A level as a 22-year-old. Um, Braves have done well basically with drafting pitching in general. Like they just, they, you know, they've got Spencer Schwellenbach right mm -hmm. now in the rotation. Like they just have this ability to find pitching towards the top of the draft. A lot of it out of college, but some high school arms as well. Like Smith Schauber is a guy who's yeah. become, you know, like definitely part of that. But I think from the race perspective, like if we're if we're training Eflin, like we're going to want uh, at least a guy who is quasi big league ready in Dodd, you know, like we can at least mess around with and see what we've got. And then we want like a real true like pitching prospect. And we think for the Braves, that is Drew Hackenberg, who is probably there. He's he's probably a top five prospect for them right now, which which it's not a great system, but he's probably a top five prospect in the Braves system. Drew, D-R-U-E. Um, yeah, does that add to the aura if you've got a slightly different spelling of Drew? Babes is my aura guy. Uh, you can have him. <laughs> I believe he's also, I want to say he's quarterback Christian Hackenberg's brother. I was going to say the last name Hackenberg. That's a pretty, you know. Was he a Jets guy? Did I Do I have that right? I, feel I like think he was the Jets. The Jets. I think yeah. you're right on that. Yeah, I, uh, I liked him because um, I thought he was tough draw at Penn State with what they were rolling out there. Uh, I think I I want to say I was wrong on it, late round quarterback. Anyways, um, how about that? And we got Kirk Cousins and Jake Cousins right now. So the the, the baseball <laughs> football arm connection uh, remains strong. What do you got there? He's got a bunch of brothers. Christian Hackenberg, the most famous, but Brandon Hackenberg was drafted in the MLS draft. Adam Hackenberg was an MLB draft pick, 18th round of the 2021 draft. So they're covering a lot of sports, those wow, Hackenberg we, Mom and dad had busy weekends. You kids are playing everything. Soccer, football, baseball. Uh, so, Bailey, this is where I think we there will be some breaking of the wall. My initial reaction here is no. Right. But... I guess what I haven't felt, and I, I know there's been some stats flying around with it, is how bad the Braves' fifth starter has truly been this year. That I, I guess I would ask you, like, how, how is that truly felt? Because from, from the outside looking in, it's like, oh, yeah, that stinks, but you still got guys that are throwing the ball really good. But I do think on a day-to-day -day fandom level, when that fifth starter spot comes up, it's like, okay, so we're probably not going to go on a win streak. Um, today could be a tough one. We lost yesterday. Now we're set up bad for today. I guess how bad has that truly felt? It, it feels bad. I think it would feel a little bit better if we were just a little bit sure in our, in our playoff spot to begin with. Like, I don't necessarily – I don't think the Braves are going into this – trade deadline being like we got to chase down the Phillies I think there's maybe more of let's get some pieces and see what happens but we really need to secure the fact that we're going to be a wild card team and go to the playoffs which just the way they've been playing even just coming out of the all-star break like that's not totally guaranteed even though the National League is definitely weak in that regard so like my I guess my thing is like get the Braves in a short series and put Sale uh you know uh Freed and Reynaldo Lopez and, and Morton, you know, on the mound, and they're not going to worry about who the fifth starter is, you know, because like they don't necessarily need that to, to go on a run in the playoffs. But it's just and but the, the thing is, there's guys like that, right? Like we saw it with we've seen it with the Phillies with Taiwan Walker, like Taiwan Walker, he goes there, right. he posts, he makes his starts, and then they get to the playoffs and they said, thanks for the help, buddy. We appreciate it. We got it from here, you know. Um, I, I, so I think there's elements of that in training for, for Zach Eflin, even though he's been, you know, pretty solid. Well, I guess, and that's where the other side of this, I, and I, I think I'm going to land on a no is that I don't think Zach Eflin has the upside that the Braves as, as an organization 
Reynaldo Lopez, look what they tapped into there and look at the price tag on him that if I'm bringing in Zach Eflin and, uh, you know, I, I don't know if this is right or offends you, but he's kind of, is he the a best case Chad innings eater? Like, you know, the, the upside there with Eflin, and this is a little rude coming off of last year where he was sixth in the AL Cy Young, which is kind of mind-boggling. Um, but if I'm the Braves, I like to think I have, I know the recipe, whether it's my young pitchers you talked about, whether it's a Reynaldo Lopez. We just tapped into Chris Sale again, which, you know, they more so the points go to health there, which maybe that's the Braves training staff. But I'd like to think that one year 18 for next year for Eflin, I think to the Braves isn't as appealing it's almost it becomes more of a detriment because I I think I could find the next reliever turn starter for eleven mil next year and tap into him. So I think I'm a no. All right. Well, there we go. I think I think it's good that we do have a no on the board. Yeah. Uh, you know, and yeah, I mean Hackenberg seems like he's pretty good, and you know, like the the Braves are so eager to call some of these guys up very quickly from double A AA and triple A. Anyways, like who's to say that you know they don't feel like they could call him up in a pinch if needed, you know, just to there's like with between him and some of the other guys, it's like, yeah, like they think they can figure out the fifth starter basically is what you're saying for, for this year and next year. Like I I think, you know, what's going on with James Paxton right now? I I know the Dodgers and the Braves probably don't want to link up, but if I'm like, if I'm the Braves, I I think I could get 10 starts to a two five ERA with Paxton and not have to be worried about next year for probably less of a price tag than Eflin. So I, I, I yeah. think I do my shopping elsewhere. Well, and the Dodgers would probably pay Paxton down to like league minimum salary anyways, and then try to get a little something, something in return. But that little something, something would probably still be less than Drew Hackenberg and Dylan Dodd. So, right. you know, I, I hear where you're coming from. Okay. So we got to know. Good, good for us. Uh, you want to change jobs or are you good in Atlanta? I think I'm ready to change jobs. I've got a good job for you. It's arguably the only job that's better. Uh, you are the GM of the Los Angeles Dodgers. Wow. Wow. Free- Friedman out? Is he- yeah, Fre- Friedman out, Storiali in. Yeah. Are you okay. Storiali or Storiali? This is, a, this is a good thing to find out now I've known you for like four years. Honestly, uh, unfortunately, the answer is not going to help you out. I don't really know. Um, okay. I was told... Growing up, Storielli, like the the A should be like an E sound. Um, Storiel, I I don't know. I've kind of I brought it up at a couple family holiday events, and I don't really know. I just know you're supposed to pronounce the E, but again, like that could have been some wacko two generations ago that like did it as a joke, and now we just say that. I had a uh, when I was in school, like elementary school, I had a friend from uh georgia like the republic of georgia the country mm. who had like a crazy last name with and there are a lot of consonants in a row and i would just like ask him like how do you pronounce your name and he would just honestly shrug his shoulders be like i don't really know yeah i mean that's like tough. we don't know especially at a <laughs> young a tough, age yeah that's tough i think uh it's nikolai skittish Vili from georgia um we'll circle who back is that? On that he was an nba draft he was one of the first nba like foreign draft picks that people just had no clue uh, okay. um, and i think he like went fifth overall and it it just never clicked for him but um we can save that for post trade deadline yeah i thought that was a baseball player i was like you're just dropping names on me i've never Let's heard see. before Nikolai, um anyways you are you're the dodgers yes someone's calling ring 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 uh, hello. Hey, this is not a long distance call. Don't worry about it. Uh, this is the Los Angeles Angels. I was, I was wondering, I've been thinking about the Los Angeles Angels recently. Um, just take the five to the four Oh five. What's uh, what's going on over there? Zach Neto, we man. Just, good for you guys. Yeah. Th- oh, thanks man. Yeah. And, and you know, we're, we're excited about Logan O'Hoppy as well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've got, we've got, you know, Things aren't going great necessarily, but we've got franchise pieces at important decision, uh, positions, it seems like. So we're at least excited about that. Yeah, hell yeah. Um, Let me tell you what's going on. Well, first of all, we just want to check in how Shohei. He's great. He's great. Okay. Uh, he sends. He misses it. He Oh, he's always talking about it. 
Um, mm -hmm. But he made a bet on himself, so. Well, we, you know, we're glad he's talking about it because it seems like we didn't talk to him at all. <laughs> it sure didn't. Especially There's all these the headlines end. coming out that we never actually spoke a word to him. Yeah. <laughs> directly. Yeah, uh, they knew. All right. So, uh, funnily enough, we have a guy on our roster who, if you can just, you know, work your way through the mental Rolodex of trades that never happened, you wanted, you wanted this guy mm. years ago. Mm. And now he's doing pretty good. Yeah. And so we just want to, if we can just jog the memory a little bit, like, do you remember what player I'm talking about? I think we had something in place for Luis Renjifo. Um, That's right. Was that Jock Peterson trade that that fell out? There was. It was part of the Mookie Betts. The Mookie Betts was going to be a, uh, you know, a three team trade involving the Angels, and they were going to be moving pieces. But basically, the the Angels were uh, going to get, uh, and there I think there were. It later came out later, like Taylor Ward was maybe part of this deal as mm. well, going to the Dodgers. Uh, but they were going to get Andy Pajes, who is now basically mm. the center fielder for the Dodgers, yeah. uh, given a, a, you know, a rash of injuries and underperformance some places. So we're we're not going to ask for Andy Pajes, although I did think about it because I thought I thought it'd be really funny if four sure. years later they right. just went ahead and did that. Run it back. We're, we're now yeah. set up for it. We're fine with this. Yeah, we already kind of agreed, right? One president. You agreed to this we in principle. This. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you some things about Luis Renjifo, and let me tell you some things about the Dodgers as I try to sell you on them. Mm. This guy, um, this guy, he offers versatility. Yeah. Uh, he could play you some second base. He could play some third base. He could play some corner outfield. And what's funny is if you just look at the Dodgers right now, like where the positions where they've struggled a little bit, um, second base, third base, little corner outfield. So that is, Renjifo is like a slam dunk fit into mm. the position player core there because I think they've just... You know, like, yes, you've got Otani and Freeman and Will Smith and Mookie Betts will be back eventually. And But it's like really beyond that, not too much going on with this lineup. Like it's not the deepest. And I think uh, Ringhifo is is potentially a lineup lengthener because this is a guy who's just gotten a little bit better every year. So two years ago, he had a 102 OPS plus. Last year, he had a 112. This year, he's up to a 124. And when you combine that with a guy who can play multiple positions, we think he has value to the Dodgers organization. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, Luis Renjifo, like you said, there there have been the gradual steps along the way. It seems like he's landed in a, a really strong spot, the versatility. Um, yeah, I'm interested to see where you go again with it. I, I just looked up one thing that I, a little bit of a head tilt for me, but, but please continue. Well, what is your head tilt I'd like to hear? So I was going to look into uh, Luis Renjifo Mall's lefties. Um, he... He's fine, first righties, but first lefties, he is an elite player. I think he's hitting like 380, like high nines OPS that I was going to see like, okay, Dodgers, they are currently known for their lefties in the lineup. How, what, what's yeah. it look like? Do they have a struggle? Uh, they have the second best win percentage versus lefties that the Renjifo righty mauler lane that could be part of his upsell, I, I guess... That's currently not applicable. Yeah, I still think it is applicable, but just because, okay. like, we're talking about, you know, the, at the positions he plays, we're talking about, like, Jason Hayward, sure. Max Muncy, Gavin Lux, you know? Um, Can't hurt. All lefties. Can't hurt. Yeah, but I, I understand. I think Tay Oscar has helped that that was definitely a priority for them was because he is, he, that guy is historically a lefty mauler. Love him, man. Yes, and and congratulations to him on the home yes. run derby as yes. well. Um, so we we the Angels we're looking at it. We're looking at the Dodgers system, and uh, again, you know, we've got a weak system. I think what we need is bulk, really. Like, mm. um, we're we're not gonna go after your top guys. We're not coming after. Hey, give us give us Dalton rushing. Give us Kyle Hurt or you know someone like that. Um. We've got a package of prospects we're interested in, so I'm just going to kind of rattle them off. They're all kind of, you know, 10 to 20 range in your system. Um, but there is some, you know, these are some guys that you have, uh, in fact, invested draft capital into. So one of those is going to be uh, Kendall George, who is a 19-year-old mm. outfielder. He was your first rounder last year, has looked just okay in pro ball. I mean, he's 19 playing an A, sure. uh, so he's younger than most of the competition he's facing, but 
Kendall George is a guy who we're going to want. We're also going to want, and this is probably the guy with the most pedigree right now. Cause I think he's actually there's, I, I actually saw him crop up like kind of honorable mention on a top 100 prospect list. You guys have a shortstop named Alex Freeland. Mm. Who's had a big uh, season between high a and double a he's your 2022 third rounder. Uh, we want a guy that you ha- guys actually have in the majors right now. His name's Justin Rebelski. Mm. Um, he's uh, just started making starts for you, but you have so many starting pitchers anyways. I don't think you would necessarily miss him. And you're probably gonna add a starter at this deadline anyways, you know, so uh just not from us and then i've also got our eyes on we've got we got a throwing type guy uh his name's reynaldo yin he's 20 he's an a and he throws like 100 miles per hour and he's a reliever what are we thinking here reynaldo yin is the future of this program <laughs> um that i i can't believe you try to sneak that in on the end i know well and you guys are a blue blood program yes i mean we uh hey you mentioned our pitching depth we know what we're doing across town Maybe take notice. Um, actually, maybe maybe send <laughs> maybe send Ben Joyce in on the deal because we could we could actually. People are worried what you guys are gonna do with him, um, but enough of that. Um, so I've I've got two things going on here. I'm and one is I'm feeling a little lame stream about it because I'm gonna build on it. Is the verse lefties thing again? Um, and I don't, I don't like that whole hodgepodge, like, you know, it, you, you made me laugh and perk up when you said, let's just run back the Andy Pajes thing. Cause that's just fun. Um, no, I, we're, we're the Dodgers though. Yeen is going to be a closer in this league. Um, you know, R- Robleski like that, that guy, he's got the best wipeout blank in the organization. Um, the other thing that I'm, I think I'm saying no on both sides so I'm I'm now joining the Angels front office for a little bit. Okay. Maybe this is dumb, and please call me out if you're wrong, because I I said it about the Dodgers, and I I understand what you're saying. Like we're the Dodgers, we want to get better and as good as possible. Twenty six and ten versus lefties this year, second best in baseball behind the Guardians. They're thirty four and thirty one versus righties, which that's just a little shocking. And again, I, this is a little bit of an old school stat, so there's not much analytics to it. But here are my analytics: these are teams that are five hundred or worse against lefty starting pitching. So where Renhifo could really leave his dent, obviously the versatility, and he's slightly above league average against right-handed pitching that a, a team could obviously use Luis Renhifo. 500 or worse against lefty. The Milwaukee Brewers, don't think they need them, but that's fine. The New York Mets, who are currently in playoff contention. Um, The Pittsburgh Pirates are currently in playoff contention, and their infield's kind of good, but um, whatever. The San Diego Padres, under 500 against left-handed pitching. The New York Yankees, that can use infield help, under 500 against left-handed pitching. The Houston Astros, under 500 against left-handed pitching. Texas Rangers kind of out as of now, but they are as well. The Arizona Diamondbacks, again, don't think they're in the mix uh, unless they wanted to bail they on are. Suarez. Or, or excuse, yeah. I, I meant in the Renhifo mix. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, um, continue. 15 and 21 versus lefties. Uh, my Cincinnati Reds, I think they've died, but they're 13 and 19 versus lefties. The Boston Red Sox are 12 and 18 against left-handed starting pitch, pitching, and they could use some infield help. Um, San Francisco Giants are 11 and 19. Um, Cubs are bad as well if we wanted to pretend they could get back in the mix. So of that mix, I included some of the other outliers, but I've got Red Sox. Let's throw the Diamondbacks in there for now. Astros, Yankees, Padres. I've got five contenders that if they're being honest with their team and their outlook for the rest of the season, this is a weakness that they need to address that somehow, that I think, Angels-wise, I think Renhifo is going to get better offers from other organizations that see that as a bigger need-slash-fit for them. Yeah, it's interesting. I I hadn't really thought about it that way. And um, just to uh, further help your point a little bit, uh, the Dodgers uh, have a 124 WRC plus versus left-handed pitching this year, which is the best in the majors. So that's that's where I guess 
and you know this this exercise is unique for a lot of reasons but i i think if if there was just an emoji i think i go red x and i i don't know i don't know if it's my side or your side but i i just think other team like if you're the boston red Sox, um and you're you're so kind of lefty heavy right now a ga- a switch hitter like Renhifo could just be massive for them or i i know this is People will call, call me out just because they want to, but the Yankees, man, uh, right now running out DJ and Glaber every day uh, to have that Renhifo option there. I, I don't watch Luis Renhifo play every day. I, hand up, uh, you know, when it's 10 p.m., I don't instantly flip to the Halos game. But what he's now done since at least the second half of last season is elite versus lefties and a very good baseball player uh, that I don't know. I think there's going to be a, a green check mark emoji from from one of these other teams and not the Dodgers. Okay, one. I have one final question for you sure. as the GM of the Angels. You know, from from one GM to another. Mm. Uh, what if we just scratch all that and you give us Andy Pajes instead? Nah, nah, honey, I'm good. I always start singing that because I think of the other who sings that song. Andy something. Andy Grammer. Um uh that would that would be just a little tricky because <laughs> some days he's our five hole hitting center fielder. He's your center fielder. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't I don't think I can do I think that would have to we would have to have another trade in the chamber lined up for maybe a Luis Robert. Now that would be some Dodgers. Oh, that Dodgers would be some move. wheeling and some dealing. Bring in Lou Bob. Uh send and send out Pajes for Renhifo. Now that's that's where me and Andrew Friedman do our work. They're saying they're saying James Outman second half resurgence. That's they, the, that's the chatter. Who said that? Who's been saying that? Uh, we've been saying it here at the Angels HQ all the time because we we would like Andy Pajes. We'd like to right some wrongs. How about Kevin Biggio holding a roster spot for those? Yeah, that's those a doctors. guy that would no longer have a roster spot if this trade were to go through. Yeah. Where um, where's Miguel Vargas at? That feels like, yeah, yeah. Get him. Well, hey, get him in the Luis Robert trade, and I think that's something that would excite me as a White Sox fan. I think I just saw that he was like DFA today, but like, man, do you ever think about Edwin Rios? Because I think about him like all oh. the time. Like, there was just a run there where it just seems like he was like the next great power hitter. Like he had like his home runs per at bat at the big league level were insane. It was a small sample, but they were insane. There's something to play in baseball pretty, and his his swing when he ran into a home run was very pretty. Enough Edwin Rios. Where yeah, uh, enough Edwin Rios talk for today. Where uh, where's my next gig? Uh, your next gig. I see we're we're we're. We're running a little long here. Yeah, we're I'm just checking, looking at the time. We could, we could be a little uh, tighter. So we'll try, yeah, we'll we'll get a little tighter here. Uh, your next gig is with the Houston Astros. Yes, yes. Hi, right, Reggie Jackson. Here I am. Yep. And then ring, ring, ring. Hello. Pick up the phone. Hello. It's me, the Detroit Tigers. Yes. Uh oh. Are you guys ready to do what I hope you're ready to do? Uh, yeah. Well, we. I will point out we have done this before. We have we have traded yeah. you an arm before, and it worked out really well for you guys, and it didn't work out well for us whatsoever. So we've been talking up here in the front office, and what we've decided is we're just not going to let you trick us because yeah. last last time that happened, I think you tricked us. We owe you guys. Let's run it back. Yeah, let's run it back. Um, I assume you know who we're talking about. We're talking about uh, Mr. Jack Flaherty. Okay, I was I was interested to see if you were gonna drop a scooble on me at first, but Jack no, Flaherty. We, yeah, we we love scooble. We can't. I mean, apparently, apparently, we won't trade him for anything less than Jackson Holiday. And I've looked at your system, and you don't have anything close to that. Sure don't. But Joey Loperfito can go and get it. <laughs> so I don't. Let's not let's not close the door on scooble. But sure, we we like what Jack Flaherty's done this year. So, so Jack Flaherty, who's having a just, I mean, what a what a great year Jack Flaherty is having. It's been unbelievable the way he has pitched this year. Like, I'll, I'll pull up the numbers here, real quick. Like, he has a three one three ERA. He has a, a three one six FIP. He's pitching, you know, fairly deep in the games. He's gone over a hundred innings in seventeen starts. 
Uh, he's striking out 32% of the batters he's faced while only walking 4% of them, which is, I mean, that's one of the best ratios in the league, period. It's it's unbelievable, the turnaround. And what I, what happens is I go back and I, and I think about last year's trade deadline, and um, I look at the Giolito trade, mm. and Giolito had probably more of a recent track record of success because Flaherty had, uh, you know, had a few uh, rough years there in the middle. But but basically the commonality they had, besides the fact they went to the same high school, is that they were the best rental arms available, which is to say you're trading for two months of this guy, right. and then they're going to test free agency and most likely probably sign somewhere else, uh, to be honest with you. And the return for the Giolito deal was just massive. Massive, yeah. dude. Like, I know the Angels were desperate, but I mean, uh, Edgar Caro like you know, was like a top 100 prospect, like offensive catcher, Kai Bush. When the Angels did that draft in, uh, I want to say 2021, where they did, do you remember this? All pitchers. Yeah. No that was like the best one they got. So, they, and then they traded him. That's funny. <laughs> God, and it's uh, for for the baseball people. Caro just got called up to AAA, and it looks like Kai Bush also just got called up to AAA. Both of them did really well at Double A. So. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Nice hey, job, White Sox. White Sox. Way to go. You're killing it, Chris Getz. I mean, Edgar Edgar Caro, he's a catcher. He has a he has a career like 400 on base percentage in the minors, you know. And That's he's been good. young at every level he's played at. It's so there's way, something there. It's a good way to also become not a catcher if he'd like. Yeah, he's he, he that may very well be what he is. Is not a catcher, but again, if you can get on base 40 percent of the time, no one cares what position you play. It's true. Um. I'm gonna pull up the Astros top prospects because I think I've just talked myself up into oh. talking myself into upping the price. Hmm. Um, originally, I'll tell you who I definitely want. Um, we want Bryce Matthews, who's a shortstop prospect. Uh, he is 22 years old. He was their first rounder last year out of Nebraska, yep. um, and has performed well this year. He uh, did well at High A, that earned him a promotion to Double A, where he continues to uh, hold his own. Uh, another guy we want is a guy who's, I believe, is currently on the MLB roster right now, and that is uh, Jake Bloss, uh, who is a, and I hope that's how you say his last name, um, rhymes with Moss or Floss. Uh, Jake Bloss is in the majors right now. He's a guy who has experienced uh, some helium, I suppose, as well. Uh, he was a 2023 third rounder, so same draft, and just absolutely crushed, uh, you know, pro ball and very quickly earned himself a call up to the majors, uh, you know, basically a year after he was drafted and he's made uh, two starts for them so far. So so normally I was going to say we'll start with that for for Jack Flaherty, uh, you know, for two months of him. I think I'm going to want a, a throw in here. And I, mm. I'd be curious to hear just from your perspective, Houston Astros, is, is there anyone you would consider throwing in on him? Uh, you know, you mentioned Lil Profito earlier, but I, I'd, I'd be interested to see if there's any other names that uh, could maybe help move the needle for us. Because just looking at the... Looking at the Caro plus Kai Bush, like we understand we're probably not going to get that. That was a pretty unique situation, right. but uh, we'd like somebody else. I mean, yeah, that's where uh, – and my Southern southern twang kicking in again. Uh, you know, we, we're the Houston Astros. Uh, do, please do not compare us to the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Uh, we, we do not conduct business the same way. Here's what I'll say. Um before I tell you I'm gonna what other name I'm gonna throw in, I'm gonna tell you no thank you, Detroit. Ooh. Um we sure has our starting pitching been a little thin this year. Yes. Hunter Brown has turned the corner. Uh, yeah, he's been really good. Back to Justin Verlander 2.0. Ronel Blanco, we're gonna we're gonna ride him uh, as long as we can because he's been great. Uh 30 years old, kinda wasn't I think his story was he was working as a car wash and they they took a chance on him and now he's he's been a, an amazing pitcher. Uh, Eric, I think the story is he was working as a waitress in a cocktail bar. <laughs> I gotta reread that. I think that was an athletic <laughs> article. Um, Framber's Framber, he's the best. Uh, Spencer Arigetti has slightly turned it around a little bit at after some tough times. And like you mentioned, we called up Jake Bloss. Um, we're hoping to get Justin Verlander back at some point, and I, I think we will. Um, that I don't, you know, Jake Bloss, some, pl some places have him as our number two prospect. 
Um, yeah. We really like what he's developing into that for the Jack Flaherty rental, it becomes the the Tanner Scott game we played a little bit. We're, we're talking, what, eight starts plus postseason? Uh, yeah. Which, as good as Jack Flaherty has been, and in an obnoxious way, out of phone call mode, uh, someone who I'm lucky enough to say is like a friendly guy, a couple all-star weekend texts, whatever. Um, the Cole Tucker, Vanessa Hudgens affair, everyone's still talking about. Um, he's been nasty this year. That yes, I could see Houston going that way. Uh, our owner did come out who, you know, I, I love Mr. Crane. Is it Jim Crane still? No. they. Is he out from that whole thing? Dana oh, Brown, no, he, right? Uh, he, he's the guy. No, Dana Brown the, is the GM. He's who's calling the shots. Yeah. Um, we, we're we investing for the future. Um, and that first round pick, uh, Bryce Matthews, who you referenced, Houston kid. Um, mm. we, we've got him in the pipeline. He's next. Uh, Jake Bloss, I, I, I have him penciled into our rotation for the next five years that... Uh, that price tag for Jack Flaherty, I, again, that, that was an angel's payment. We're, we're not about that life. Yeah. We, we think Jake Bloss is probably equivalent to Kai Bush, maybe a little better, but we don't think, I mean, Bryce Matthews, I get he's a first rounder, but he's not Caro. But again, you know, you've made yourself clear. You're, you guys are not the angels. We are not. Um, yeah. And I just, I think we still have our we have our playoff innings from the starters that we're gonna find. Like I think Framber, I think Ronell, I think Hunter Brown, and hopefully Verlander. Uh, if, if you think you think Ronell and Hunter Brown are gonna you know get you those playoff wins, I think so. Uh, and I, you know, if I was being really rude about someone I just complimented. Um, Jack Flaherty. Uh, you know, I know it's a different season, but last year uh, when the playoffs came around for the Orioles, he wasn't a, wasn't a part of their decision-making. So I, I realize he's a different pitcher this year than last year, um, but I I don't know. I think I would, I would be scouring the market for a slightly... I think there's starting pitchers to be had in this market, and I guess this is what I... Uh, going back to... Uh, the Atlanta Braves, for where that price tag is at currently, I, I would love to see where Kikuchi's price tag is at. I, I would love to see a couple of the other starting pitchers. So maybe this will be my first circle, like instead of green check mark or red X. I think what you provided is fair, but I think I would look for a couple more. I think I would really flush out the other pitching offers with that on the table. So you're gonna give it. You're gonna give it a maybe. I'd. I'd say it's, it's a def. If nothing else comes, because the other side of this, we are the Houston Astros. We go to the ALCS. Right. We win World Series. That yeah, we need another starting pitcher. That if push came to shove, and that's the final offer out there, I do think we would probably go through with that. Yeah, and you know we could we could toss in someone in there like, um, you know, Gibson Long's been hurt, but maybe that's someone in the long term you'd be interested in. Uh, you know, we could we could maybe work out the the details. Uh, Honestly, this, what this what deal happened? What would put it over the top? And maybe this is where you're throwing third body. I do think we could use a bullpen arm. So I don't know if that's Tyler Holton. I don't know if that's Chafe, and I don't know if that's Foley. Um, the Shel- not Foley. The Shelby Miller th- third breakout. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I think Flaherty and a bullpen arm. I think things get a lot more real. Um, so yeah. All right, we're going to leave the iron in the fire on that one. Yes, yes, we'll circle back in the next week. Okay, well, you're going to be accused of some um, sort of like insider trading deal right now because, you know, as the Astros are trying to build up to compete with the Mariners, you, Jake, have become the GM of the Seattle Mariners. Wow, well, I mean, there's already rumors about this ever since that Kendall Graveman trade, so I'm, I'm I'm glad it's out in the open now. Yeah, you're you're playing both sides so that you always come out on top. <laughs> That's how I win. Yes. Um ring 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 ring. Yes. Hello. Hey. This call is coming from within the division. 
We are the Oakland Athletics. Okay. Love love the Oakland Athletics. Um, you guys are a, a year and a half away. I, I feel it. But it's it's our time. Said Well, first of all, if we were a year and a half away, I don't think we were we are going to make you this offer. So we may <laughs> hold you to that. But um we're the Oakland Athletics. Everyone kind of wants us to trade Mason Miller, which is really weird because we have him for like six more years yeah. or five more years. So I don't think we're gonna do that, to be honest with you. It's just between there's no need. That's fine. We need we, at least someone. We've got bullpen. We tap into guys all the exactly. time. Taylor Saucedo. Yeah. We're good. I, I don't know if Gabe Spire is still there, but I'm I'm going to say he is. <laughs> and he's dealing. You know? Yes. He may be on the Red Sox now. I might have forgotten that. No, you're good. Um, but uh, with Brent Rooker, yeah. who, who is, which is who we're talking about here, my, my reasoning for Seattle to trade for Brent Rooker is very simple. Uh, they, they come from a philosophy of we don't have any bats and we hate spending money. Mm, yes. Yes. Um, and Brent Rooker is he's cheap now. And then he's got three arbiters after that. And here's my thing. Like, I'm, I'm going to be very clear here because I don't want to be insulting to Oakland A's fans whatsoever or Brent Rooker. People are really underestimating the trade value of Brent Rooker right now. They're underestimating it because they're looking at Luis Robert, right? For example, who would be the other sort of like big bat controllable three years, you know, plus control after after this year moved like Luis Robert. He's got his team friendly deal that he's moving towards the back end of. And those three years for him are going to cost fifty five million, yeah. which is not nothing. It's still cheap for someone of his caliber, but it's not nothing. Brent Rooker, it's three arb years like he, he's he's not going to command that much money, you know, in those three across those three arb years, even if he comes, if he were to come even close, it'd be because he was awesome. Yeah. It'd be because he was incredible. Um, so Brent Rooker, like, and also Brent Rooker has a, like a 168 WRC plus he's like a top five hitter in the league this year on a rate basis. Like if you look at the leaderboard, it's he's between like Gunner and Bryce Harper. Like it's ridiculous. So I will say the, the price tag on on a rooker deal is like way higher than people think think people think it's like trading for people think people think it's like what the braves did at the 21 deadline where it's like ah here's like a slightly unwanted uh jock peterson and eddie rosario like no this is this is the best pure hitter available potentially and it's three years of control for him and he's like yes so i'm gonna preface that by saying like we're the oakland A's. we're kicking around the idea of trading Brent Rooker, but it's going to take a lot. So we just want to hear. But I mean, first of all, you guys don't have any bats. So what are your perspective on uh, Brent Rooker? I, I, this is uh, baseball analysis, Jake, not front office, Jake. Brent Rooker, the offensive stats are unreal. I, I can't believe where his OPS is at. Uh, 939 uh, this season. Uh, and yeah, again, you, we talk, you talked about post hype guys before, like Brent Rooker was a prospect. Um, yes, I, I do think the only thing I would counter back at you, uh, for how valuable Brent Rooker is, is that if you see, if you've seen a player be a bit of a pumpkin before, that's just out there. Uh, it's out there forever that, um, and with Brent Rooker turning 30, uh, and November 1st, I, I do think there's as much as you would be upselling the how valuable this guy is and you have the years of control, not a free agent till 2028, between the defensive question marks slash, you know, where, where would you put him? Um, and I, I think just douchey baseball guy, which, okay, now I am just being myself. Um, you're playing in games that don't fully matter. That, hey, maybe that's my, my New York obnoxious is showing and I, I see you rolling your eyes, but to expect this out of Brent Rooker, a team is, I think Brent Rooker gets traded because I think a team is seeing the value that you're talking about and I think Oakland is going to, who knows what Oakland's going to ask for? Like, they don't want your ready prospect, right? <laughs> so, like, I, I think the Br Brent Rooker value equation is going to make sense for a team. And I do think you're in the right ball. Again, this is me not representing the Mariners currently. Uh, that one of the teams, the team I really like for him is the Pittsburgh Pirates. Um, I think they have now hit their timeline. You already have some other hitters around him that you're banking on 
uh, that are a little more established, that it's like bat Brent Rooker fourth, and now we have a top half of the lineup. Um, but yes, I, I think a team is going to capitalize on Brent Rooker for everything you said. I, I just, I don't see the value getting to Looney Tune land because I, I think teams would be willing to walk away for defensive reasons and age reasons. Yeah, that, that that's definitely uh, a possibility there. And also, like, you know, you like, you don't love to trade for a guy who strikes out 30 plus right. percent of the time when he's about to turn 30 anyways. You know, like, that's not generally a favorite thing for GMs to do. Well, dude, that's where I will now put my Mariners hat back on, and I'm, I'm nervous for what you're going to ask for uh, because we've been living in fear of strikeouts for two years now. We, our offseason was to address our strikeout problems. It's gotten worse. <laughs> um, and we unfortunately have a track record of hitters coming here and having a bad time. That if we empty the wagon for Brent Rooker and that hurts us, God, like, the Mariners will become a joke. Yeah. Well, I will say, and I'll say this in Brent Rooker's defense, like, he hits in Oakland. That's a really hard ballpark right. to hit in. And that's, I think, a lot of the fears of the Mariners fans is is the ballpark itself seems to really suppress offense, especially these last few years. And so they've seen guys come up. Teoscar's a good example, right? Teoscar is one year. It went great. He goes over the Dodgers. All of a sudden, he's great again. You know, and yeah. that they don't they want to avoid that. You know. Yes. Um. Here's what I'm gonna ask for. So here's the way I view. By the way, the the Mariners in general, they have poker chips basically. Mm. Um. And or or I guess you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna change up the analogy a little bit. They have cards in their hands, and they can eventually, at some point, whenever they want to, they can play the Emerson Hancock or Brian Wu card. Um. They have six big league starters and only five spots in the rotation basically. Uh, and Hancock filled in for Wu and then Wu came back and Wu's had weird injury stuff. But I think it would be, I, I think it'd be, I think Mariners fans actually kind of like the idea of trading Wu, but I think it's just, who's going to want to trade for Wu. Cause he's had such a weird year. Like every, every six days, Brian Wu goes out there. He throws five scoreless innings and he says, ah, my arm hurts. And then he's addicted to MRIs. He's had like 10 MRIs this year. <laughs> and then they're like, he's fine. And then he goes and he does it again. I think he's got like radioactive superpowers. He's been in that tube like half of the year. That's wild because most players hate the tube, but not Brian Wu. He, he, he loves the tube. I think maybe he finds it a place for like quiet contemplation. Yeah. A little lock in, a little zen. Yeah. Um, so anyways, <laughs> uh, we think Hancock is is the better fit right. in that regard because it, it you know and and I will say, despite the draft pedigree and the prospect pedigree, like I don't think he's amazing, you know, like he's okay. and again small sample. He's made twelve starts. The ERA and FIP are around five at the big league level. He's performed well in the minors, but I, I'm not sure if he's someone I expect to live off the you know up to the being. He was the sixth overall draft pick in the 2020 draft, so he had the pedigree uh, out of UGA. So we want, you know, we think Hancock's probably more like high, high floor, lower upside. So we're going to want some upside in there. And the upside for us is, is very clear. Um, we want Lazaro Montez, who mm. is uh, getting sort of baby Jordan comparisons in the minors. Uh, Lazaro Montez, uh, Cuban, he's 18. Um, is he in the complex league or has he made it up to a, let me, let me check on him, uh, Lazaro Montez. Can I, while you look up Lazaro Montez, um, uh -huh. how how do you keep your tabs on prospects? Like, I, I know I've played out of the park base, but, you know, some people listening to this are probably laughing, like, Lazaro Montez, really, dude? So, what? I guess, what's your, what's your elevator speech on how you keep tabs on prospects? Um, I would say Fangraphs has really good minor league leaderboards, and you can filter them. So, for example, like, or let you know. Let's say you just go look up. Oh, who are the best hitters in AAA this year? Where you're gonna get a bunch of 28 year olds, you know, right. um, who are like quad A guys. And right. look, sometimes those guys come like. Oh, here's a good example. Um, Cleveland have this guy right now. Uh, I want to say uh, Daniel Schneeman, yeah. who is like this. Like he was like a 26, 27 year old raking in AAA. They call him up, and he's good in the majors too. You know, yeah. like he's he's contributing. Um, so there's elements of that. But like you can be like, who are the best hitters in Double A? less than 24 years old, you know, and that's right. kind of how I do it. Um, okay. Yeah. It's also good to like try to, 
realize where these guys are coming, especially these like young international guys, like where are they coming from? Like, what was the bonus that the team offered to sign them, et cetera? Like, what's the excitement about them? Um, but yeah, Lazaro Montez, I, I got his facts a little bit wrong. He's 19 now uh, out of Cuba um, and he's playing currently in high A. He earned a promotion from A to high A because he just destroyed A, uh, 13 home runs in 65 games. 938 OPS and then in high he hasn't been doing that but like he's he's 19 he's facing competition that on average is three and a half years older than him and he's gotten comparisons to Jordan not just because he's like a bat first like lefty you know big Cuban but because he like someone told me he like works with the same swing like hitting coach in Cuba that Jordan did so it's like he's very clearly you know like going down that path and the fear with him would actually funnily enough be similar to the fear with Rooker which is there is going to be some swing and miss. And also he's probably not really going to play a position all that well, right. um, but he's a long way out. And I think just for, for the Oakland A's for, for trade to make sense for them, like they get a combination of that, that big league ready arm who's still good, young and has many years of control left. And then they get, you know, the, the upside power bet that they can really dream about building a lineup around in the future, because that, that is what this guy really is. He is a, a very special talent offensively. And the only reason he's not way higher on prospect lists is because he doesn't really have the tools. It seems to play a a position all that competently. (sighs) Bailey, this is tough for me. Um, Cause you mentioned I'll uh, going full circle on everything. Now Uh, you just talked about the triple a guys who kill it at uh, an older age and Here's Brent Rooker, who in 2022 was 27 in AAA, um, absolutely mauling. And then he he gets his follow-up opportunity with Oakland. And uh, he's been incredible, man. And I it it I, I do feel bad that I half-knocked his numbers for Oakland because I'm also a little bit of a lineup protection guy still, and Oakland is a tough place to hit. That what Brent Rooker Brent Rooker has done has been incredible. I just as the Seattle Mariners, and dude, maybe this is lame. I I can't cash in my chips on Brent Rooker. I, I'm sorry. I the, if let's say the hitting does go uh, to a degree, whatever that means. Uh, defensively, again, I I don't know where or when or what value I'll be getting there. Um, and you know, calling anyone baby or Don, just the the chance of, we talked about the GM fear. If that's an early scouting report on this guy, and again, may, maybe I'm, this is why I'm not in a front office and why none of us are, is that maybe I'm getting named by myself because if Brent Rooker's name wasn't Brent Rooker and I just looked at the stat page, maybe I would be thinking differently. But I, I if I'm the Seattle Mariners I've been wait like you said. I've got the, I've had these cards for a while now, and it's like to yeah. fruition. We've got a whole staff here. We've got a bonus piece that if I'm cashing in my chips, it maybe it's lame name value stuff, but it's got to be it's got to be something that's just more of a lock than Brent Rooker. Yeah, I think the problem is like if like if they're gonna cash in the chip, it's gonna either it's it, to get like that name brand player that you talk about. It's it's going to be either a player with less control than Brent Rooker, right, or earning more money. And that to me, just looking at the Mariners, how they conduct business, is not necessarily the Mariners' way, right? You know, right. Um, yeah, I guess that's where I'm. If I was the Mariners and I was coming off this call, I mean. Yeah, like I, I guess another team that just jumped in my head that I, I think would be willing to risk, risk a little more would be like San Diego, like because I, I could be getting they had him, right? But I, yeah. I could be getting that Brett Rooker that you're talking about, the value for the next four years, and he can maul where he does have a. There's a lot more going on with our team that I don't know, man. It just. It lines up to be a little LOL Mariners if we put our chips on the table for Brent Rooker and it doesn't click that I I don't think I can do it. Well, there you have it. I'm Brent sorry. Rooker is going to stay in Oakland A unless, you know, we get a we get another offer which we very well may from. Uh, I've heard Philly's out on him, which I I think makes sense cuz I don't the defensively the fit doesn't make right. but Pirates, I I like the Pirates that you've been talking up and they have they have a prospect pool they can pull from to make this deal happen. That's for sure. where I, 
for Brent Rooker, Boston, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, San Diego. I even think Cleveland would be a sneaky one. Uh, just, a, you know, at some point Brent Rooker should start getting paid that he might be. A, like St. Louis? I, I don't know. Like, could wouldn't that be the, the St. Louis Cardinals we used to respect as the smart baseball organization? Like, yeah, they traded for Brent Rooker and he... He had five years where he was the next Alan Craig. Um, yeah, well, that's... And also, like, it's a very Cardinalsy thing to, like, trade for a guy who's really good that, like, when it seems like... It's like, oh, that guy was available to trade for. You right. know? Like, when they got Goldschmidt and Arenado, it was like, oh, why didn't... Why didn't we just do that? Why didn't my favorite team just do that, you know? The Rockies paid them? Yeah. Um, what a world, Bailey. What a world. Um, if I If I was keeping track, was that six... That was six. And luckily we, we kept it. made it through the trade deadline. Luckily we kept it to a tidy hour and a half. Um, yes. And that's just the excitement of baseball, baby. Because um, it's here. Uh, I guess. Oh, I just, sorry. I just got a notification oh. on my phone. Uh, all of these players have been traded to different teams than we just discussed. Oh, Completely okay. different ah, deals. One so, notey? That was, that was uh, already outdated. Was, yeah. that, was that Shams that just had all six trades? Yeah, Shams had them. Uh, he he actually, it, there were so much details, he had to link a spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> Shams Google Doc. Um, Bailey, thank you for that. Uh, as as I stated, that is a uh, baseball fan's paradise for an hour and a half. Uh, there's a couple significant others that have made it this far that I we apologize uh, and sorry that your loved ones enjoy this, but it's what we yeah. like. And I say, let me say, enjoy your weekend road trip to... Omaha yes. or Kansas City or, or wherever you may be going, but it's a long drive. It's a, there's some beautiful spots in Dover, Delaware that you can mm -hmm. just have a weekend. Um, Bailey, thank you so much. Uh, we we like have to wrap this up at this point. Um, yeah. Any any Bailey teasers? Any foolish things we should be looking at? I mean, coming. I mean, coming soon to your uh, subscription inbox on Foolish Baseball, but I, I can't uh, I can't talk about what it is, but. Uh, believe it or not, for the first time, I will be focusing on a minutia of baseball. So, oh, yeah, I know. Wow, really trying something new here. Got to, got to throw in the off speed. Um, yeah, Bailey, thank you so much. Uh, and I, I think we'll wrap it up, Beebs. Waking Jake is a production of Dan Patrick Productions, John Boy Media, and Workhouse Media.